The Advocate for Success Season 1, Episode 8 Mary E. Ryder Produced by Elton Thomas Empowerment can be expressed through your apparel. Visit the Mission Advocate store on Etsy at etsy.com slash shop slash mission advocate. It's 1889, St. Louis, Missouri, is the fourth largest city in America. The emergence of railroads in the late 19th century brought St. Louis into the national economy, and it became the world's first significant rail center. The construction of the Eads Bridge in 1874 made it easier to travel from the west coast to the east. The economy flourished because of the city's central location, its dominance of the fur trade, and its ability to provide access to river and rail transportation. But not everyone was benefiting from these economic marvels. An 11-year-old girl, Mary Ryder, is enjoying the riverfront attractions in downtown St. Louis with her family. As they pass under the Eads Bridge, Mary notices a man standing holding a tin cup. She walks up to the man and says, hello, but instead of looking at her, he keeps staring in the same direction and says, hello. Mary then asks the man, why do you not look at me? The man turns his head towards Mary, still not looking directly at her, and says, I'm blind and cannot see you. Mary says, I do not understand. The man then says, close your eyes. Mary then closes her eyes as the man continues, this is how I see. Mary says, but I cannot see anything. And the man replies, yes, that is what it means to be blind. Mary had so many more questions to ask, but then her mother called, Mary, get away from that beggar and come with us. From 1890 to the 1920s, the majority of people with psychiatric or developmental disabilities were institutionalized. These institutions were often inhumane, and even when journalists like Nellie Bly went undercover to expose abusive practices, little was done to stop these atrocities. Most of the public viewed people with disabilities as a nuisance, a burden, and a scourge of society, and they were treated accordingly. Many families of people with psychiatric disabilities chose not to put their disabled loved ones in institutions, choosing instead to raise them at home. This was a complex and challenging task because, at this time, medical knowledge about disability was minimal. Physicians often did not know how to treat their patients properly, and they used outdated methods such as bleeding or boring holes in the skull. It was not uncommon for these doctors to believe that a person's mental illness or acting out behavior was the result of spiritual or moral decay. In addition, the Industrial Revolution led to a significant increase in the number of people with physical disabilities. Workers who sustained injuries due to accidents or as a result of exposure to harmful substances at the workplace could not be compensated for their losses, and they were often blamed for their disabilities. By the late 19th century, medical knowledge about disability was increasing. Doctors were becoming more aware that certain conditions and illnesses had genetic roots, and they began to distinguish between physical and psychological disabilities. Physicians were also beginning to recognize that some disabilities could be overcome through therapy. The first special education programs were delinquency prevention or manual training classes for children with disabilities and they emphasized the teaching of skills such as carpentry, sewing, and cooking. Some doctors, such as John Van Every, continued to link disability with African Americans, writing in leading medical journals that race mixing produced feeble-minded offspring. They warned that a feeble mind was a cause of moral decay, insanity, and crime. Eugenics was a powerful force in the early 20th century, and the majority of Americans supported the practice. Proponents of eugenics believed that people with disabilities, mental illness, and other genetic disorders were a drain on the economy and a threat to morality. They advocated for the rounded up and extermination of these individuals through gassing, injection, and even starvation and experimentation. By the end of the 1920s, there was a definite improvement in the treatment of people with disabilities. Several organizations were founded to support psychiatric and developmental disability patients, including the Ohio Society for Crippled Children, which later became Easter Seals. 
The federal government established a rehabilitation program in 1918 due to the large number of soldiers who came back from World War I with disabilities. In the 1920s, Mary became the president of the Commission for the Blind, today known as Rehabilitation Services for the Blind, a state agency focused on improving the lives of Missourians who are blind, and she began organizing to improve the lives of women. In a world full of discrimination, Mary sets out to change that world, as the president of the Commission for the Blind. One of her first achievements was forming a vendor program, where people who are blind could sell items like newspapers and cigars in courthouses. The Commission also acquired a workshop in 1917 to put together brooms for the state of Missouri. Though this workshop did give people who are blind a space to be productive, somehow, Mary envisioned a world genuinely equal for everyone, including women, all ethnicities, and people with disabilities. There are few historical documents of Mary Ryder, of her incredible works and contributions to making the world a better place. I sometimes wonder what she thought or talked about with people she trusted. Based on the research that's out there, along with pondering on what she must have been like in person, these words came to me which were inspired by Mary Ryder as a description of the 1920s. This world was designed for a particular gender, particular race, and particular ability. The governmental, economic, and social systems need to work together to ensure prosperity for the entire community. In hopes that someday, we will discover a world of equality, equity, and independence for all. The 1930s brought a significant increase in helping people who are blind. This increase was a result of several factors. Dorothea Lange's photo, The Homeless, depicts the effects of the Great Depression, aviator, Amelia Earhart, becomes an American icon, the Baseball Hall of Fame, opens in Cooperstown in New York, the first Braille textbook is printed, and Louis Braille perfects his literary Braille code. Also, in the United States, the movement to encourage the use of white canes began. It is said that a Lions Club member watched a blind man crossing a street with a black cane and realized it was difficult for motorists to see it. Therefore, he recommended that blind people paint their canes white to make them more visible to others. Soon, cities and states began promoting the use of white canes by passing ordinances. In the 1930s, the National Federation of the Blind was founded. Its founder, Dr. Jacobus Tenbroke, drafted the model white cane law, which is now on the statute books of most states. In the 40s, the Social Security Act passed, providing funds for state programs to aid blind individuals and disabled children. Furthermore, in the 50s, the Supreme Court's decision in Brown v. Board of Education picked up the pace of the disability rights movement. Eventually, the Civil Rights Act of 1964 made discrimination against persons who are blind illegal. The 1930s also saw a significant uptick in the women's rights movement, with many new initiatives. Activists worked on issues such as child labor, women in unions, and liquor prohibition. They also focused on equality with men, especially in the workplace. However, the movement needed to be more unified, and their activism waxed and waned over the years, as the momentum generated by each wave of change faded and then continued in less visible ways. The onset of the Great Depression slowed down progress and, in some cases, reversed it. Domesticity, motherhood, and homemaking once again came into vogue as it became harder for women to find jobs. Even when work was available, wages were usually low. Women began to participate in the informal economy, selling goods in roadside stands or renting out rooms for lodgers. Black women, meanwhile, found their voice in the Harlem Renaissance and began fighting to end racial injustice and discriminatory practices such as lynching. Some of the first wave feminists continued their fight for broader freedoms, with a group known as the Red Stockings analyzing the politics of housework and holding public speakouts on abortion. Nevertheless, societal attitudes were still restrictive, a 1928 law banned Radcliffe Hall's anodyne lesbian novel The Well of Loneliness with the claim that moral poison kills the body, but moral poison kills the soul. Florence Ellenwood Allen of Ohio was elected to a state Supreme Court, 
becoming the first woman appointed to such a position. In 1935, Eleanor Roosevelt became FDR's second wife and head of the Federal Emergency Relief Administration FERA, where she oversaw job creation programs for women. In the midst of the 1930s, Mary Ryder became a powerful advocate for women and for people who are blind. She paved the way for better systems, better perspectives, and better laws for citizens living in the state of Missouri. There is no doubt that Mary Elizabeth Ryder was one of the greatest advocates for success for all Missourians. In 1930, she founded the Mary Ryder Home to improve the employment situation for women, and is still serving the community today. On the Mary Ryder Home website, there is a description of the great works being done today. Mary Elizabeth Ryder's 90-plus year legacy to provide the best possible care for vulnerable women continues as an intensive residential treatment setting IRTS. The Mary Ryder Home serves 16 women with serious mental illness, providing focused therapeutic support. Mary Ryder Home is staffed 24 hours a day and also provides on-site and community-based mental and physical health support, with an emphasis on rehabilitation to avoid the need for more intensive services. The IRTS model has a therapeutic emphasis on teaching how, rather than doing for, with daily activities and instruction. In 1933, Mary converted the Blind Workshop into an independent organization, Industries for the Blind. This was made possible by Franklin D. Roosevelt's passing of the New Deal, which released a series of new federal programs to boost the economy following the Great Depression the federal government gave business to companies that hired people who are blind to work, and the main requirement back then, was to pay a wage where the workers who are blind could support themselves. Today, this organization is known as the Lighthouse for the Blind, which is serving adults and children who are blind across the state of Missouri and surrounding states. I have been employed at the Lighthouse for over 20 years, and I strongly believe in our mission, to assist individuals who are legally blind to maintain dignity and independence by making available employment, education, and support services. The Commission of the Blind changed its name to Rehabilitation Services for the Blind following the Rehabilitation Act of 1973. The vendor program, that allowed people who are blind to sell newspapers in courthouses, is today known as the Business Enterprise Program, where people who are blind manage vending machines, convenience stores, and cafeterias in governmental buildings. This description of the program can be found on the Missouri State website. The BEP helps blind persons achieve success as self-employed entrepreneurs. The BEP develops business sites in state, federal, and other locations. Furthermore, it provides business opportunities, including vending routes, convenience stores, snack bars, and full-service C. All program participants must successfully pass the National Restaurant Association NRA, Serve Safe Food Protection Manager certification. Applicants are interviewed, tested, and given worksite evaluations before acceptance for training. In the Missouri Historical Society's archive, there is a brief description of the outstanding achievements Mary found in file S0730, and reads. Mary Elizabeth Ryder is best known today as a local union activist and humanitarian. She was coined the Grand Dame of the St. Louis Labor by her peers in the labor movement. Ryder was one of ten children born to Mr. and Mrs. Daniel Murphy in St. Louis, Missouri, during the late 19th century. Widowed at age 35, she began work at the St. Louis Post-Dispatch in order to support her four children. Ryder soon became active in the Central Trades and Labor Council, serving as vice president for eight years. In addition, she was president of the Women's Trade Union League and Women's Auxiliary of St. Louis Typographic Union No. 8. An undisputed labor rights champion, Ryder showed equal passion and commitment to humanitarian work. During the Great Depression, Ryder founded the Mary Ryder Homes for Women, known today as Mary Ryder Home. She also co-founded Lighthouse for the Blind and was a member of the State Board for the Blind. Ryder retired in 1952 from her job as a proofreader for the St. Louis Post-Dispatch. 
Just two years later, she was named Woman of the Year by the St. Louis Women's Chamber of Commerce. In 1956, Ryder was named a St. Louis Globe Democrat Woman of Achievement. During my research, I came across the 1939 Biennial Report to the State of Missouri, which was produced under Mary Ryder's leadership as the President of the Commission of the Blind. This is, perhaps, the most profound statement I could find that comes directly from Mary Ryder, it reads. Just what employment for the blind means cannot be computed in dollars and cents. It is one of the finest investments the state makes because, for every dollar the state contributes, to buy the material used by the blind man and woman, to make useful articles, more than a dollar is created in wages for the blind. A job, a place to go daily, the feeling of being able though deprived of sight to earn a living, has no limit to its compensative values. This is one duty of the commission, maintaining workrooms and workshops that has so many untold values that only those in close contact with it can visualize it. Thank you, Mary, for putting forth grand efforts that result in grand improvements of today. As advocates, may we continue the efforts, until such day, all is equal, all is equitable, and, all is free, from disparity.